Just want to double check, you know. <laughs> Can't trust everybody, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. Here, I'll take a drink just to show you my trust level. <laughs> All right. All right, now it's time to get serious. All right, here we go. All right, we're going to talk to sit today about expecting the unexpected, and that was a great lead-in right there just a few minutes ago, right, and the expectations of your offering for next week, right? We're, we're just going to put faith right into this, and uh, that's the numbers that we're looking for. Of course, just be careful, because I don't know who's going to be around next week, but I remember a few churches that are out there that uh, when they wanted a certain offering for certain missionaries, the pastor just kept passing the plate and said, sorry, folks, come on, we need this much, let's go. You laugh, that's true. <laughs> All right, we're going to be looking, like I said, at several different passages. Uh, before we do that, let me just talk to you a little bit about expectations. We all have them. We all have certain things that, you know, from the time we're young, we expect, right? We get excited about things, we have our dreams, we have our hopes, and we have great expectations in life. And sometimes those expectations may come true, right? Other times, things didn't go as well as we thought, or maybe it just was completely different. We all have those experiences and challenges in life, and I know I've had those as well. Uh, we expect life to go a certain direction or a certain way. Maybe it doesn't quite go that way, and so we have to learn how to adjust. We have to learn how to uh, switch gears and uh, sometimes change and even change our own perspectives on things. I think we all can relate to this because I feel like over the last three or four years, life has been extremely difficult for all of us. We've all had to really switch gears and process what on earth is going on <laughs> on this planet, right? What is happening in the world that we live in? We've seen our world, our country change in ways that we never really expected. Our faith has certainly been tested and uh, as a result, I think our expectations of the future, and in some ways, our expectations of God have been lower. So how should, our, how should we respond to that? How is it that we need to look ahead and, and face the future and look at things differently now? It's not what we had hoped, maybe. And we're not sure what's around the corner. How do we regain our trust in God? Because if we're all honest, I think maybe some have really struggled in that area. What's going on, God? What are you doing here? Um, how are we going to change that and, and what God wants to do in our lives? How are we going to adjust to that? Maybe things aren't going to go that way that we thought it was going to go. So what's going to happen now? How do we respond? How do we switch and get our mind in gear to what God may have for us in the future? So what I want to encourage us today with is that the fact that we need to prepare our hearts to move ahead in faith and expect the unexpected. We can often look at our expectations and they can be negative expectations, right? Oh boy, I don't know what's going to happen. But that's a challenge for me, I know personally, but something that I constantly need to work, about, work on is the fact that maybe I need to raise my expectations. Maybe I need to stop and think of things differently. And, and what I want to encourage us again is that because of the God that we know and the God that we serve, I believe we need to raise our expectations to match who God really is. I think that needs to be the challenge for all of us, and I know it is for me. So I have two basic points I want to make here this morning, and like I said, we'll be looking at several different passages the first passage that I'd like us to take a look at is in Matthew chapter 8. So if you'll turn there with me. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. These are going to be, for the most of us, if you're a regular churchgoer, if you're a believer in Christ, you've been around for a while, these will be somewhat familiar passages to you. But just to look at the different expectation levels of the people within these stories and to talk about that a little bit. My main point, or my first point here really this morning, is that we should expect great things from God. If we're believers, if we are walking with God, we know who God is, we know what his word says, then we should be people that expect great things from God. We should know better, right? <laughs> we should know who he is 
and what he is capable of. But I know what it's like because we've all faced it. And sometimes, depending on the circumstances of life, we have allowed ourselves to get disoriented in our faith. I liken it to, I have some friends that are pilots, and, and I liken it to some of the stories that I hear from that. And that's kind of like a pilot that uh, gets lost in the clouds. If they're flying in the clouds. If they don't follow their instrumentation, it's easy for them to get disoriented. And I hear some of them say, you get up in that bank of clouds and everything around you is white, you're just flying along and you're just going by your own eyes and your own mind. There's times where they legitimately wonder, I don't know if I'm upside down or right side up. They don't, they don't know because they become so disoriented up there in that bank of clouds. They don't know where they're at. So they have to trust their instrumentation. They have to be able to look down at that instrument and say, okay, my instrument says I'm right side up. Sky's up there. Ground's down there, I'm good to go. They've got to rely upon that instrumentation because their mind will deceive them as they look around and get disoriented. And that's the same way, folks, that as we walk through this life, as we walk through the challenges that we face, we've got to make sure that we've got our eyes on the instrument gauge. God's word is that. It's the only truth that we have. It's the only thing that we can put our 100% trust in. And so we have to have the Word of God as our guidance, as our instrument gauge, because when we get in life and we get disoriented and things don't make sense, we can look at the Word of God and we can say, okay, God, you're there and I'm here. We're good to go. I know where I'm at. I know what I'm doing. And so that needs to be the idea here. But to be able to expect great things from God, let's look at a couple of these examples. And this particular example is what we see of the disciples. And that's really... At this stage of their faith and young, they really didn't have a lot of expectations. There was really not many expectations they had of who God was. Let's look at this, I'm um, sorry, Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 23. It says, Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The disciples were young in their faith. They were just getting to know who Jesus was. But they had spent a lot of time with him. But at the same time, their faith was still very immature. They didn't fully understand his power. And so when the storm came up, and it was severe, and it was threatening their lives, they, as many of us do in those circumstances, were expecting the worst. They were expecting the worst. They thought that they were going to die. And that's somewhat natural, right? We do that. We have those circumstances. And we look around and we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. We don't know what's going to happen. We have lost control or we don't have control or for some reason we thought we might have had control at any time in our life. But we really don't. And we get disoriented. And of course, they couldn't understand how Jesus could be asleep in the back of the boat. How can he be sleeping back? How can he be so calm? We're going to die here. And yet that test of faith. And so really in their mindset, the last thing they expected was a miracle. That wasn't where their minds were at all. They had no expectations. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're struggling in your faith. Maybe you're young in your faith. I don't know everyone here, obviously. But we're all still growing. And maybe the discouragements of life have taken their toll on your faith. Maybe your expectation level has dropped significantly because of what you have personally experienced or because of what's going on in the world. We just need to be encouraged. We need to look at stories like this and understand the truth and the reality here and to know that God is still performing miracles. Amen? That was a weak I was real weak. Okay, maybe he's not. I give up. 
Right? Who is the God that we serve? Who is he? Yeah, we get discouraged and we get frustrated, but that's who he is. He performs miracles. And let's face it, we don't know how many miracles he's probably performed to allow all of us to be here today. Amen? We have no idea how many times God has rescued us. The things that we're just not aware of, sometimes that just blows my mind to stop and think about it. I have no clue how many times <laughs> I could have been taken off the face of this earth, but God had a purpose. He had a reason. He's protecting us 24-7, folks. He's caring for us. We may not be able to physically see it, but when we look at the instrument panel and we understand and know who our God is, we realize, okay, he's got it under control. I don't know what his plan is, and I can't always make it out, but I'm okay. I'm going to be all right because I serve a great God. I serve a miracle-performing God. Let's look back at that passage that we looked at just a few minutes ago in Mark chapter 2. And I read through that. I won't read through it again. But many of us are familiar with that story too and the paralytic being lowered down. Here's an example of limited expectations. We talked a little bit about no expectations. Now we kind of look at limited expectations. Many people were hearing about Christ. They were hearing about him. He was healing people. And that arose the attention of many people. They wanted their ailments and illnesses to be healed by Jesus. They saw that it was happening. They saw that it was real. So they came with the expectation of physical healing. That was what was on their mind. We're going to lower our friend down. We have seen it. We have known this guy's going to do it, so man, we're going to fight through the crowds. We're going to even go up on the roof and open it and drop him down so that my friend gets seen and he gets healed because we're confident that this Jesus can heal him. They knew who Jesus was. They knew what he could do, and I think we can all relate to that as well, right? We know who he is. We know what he's capable of. But when they were expecting physical healing, they never expected spiritual healing. That wasn't on their mindset, as it isn't for many people, right? And for all of us who have accepted Christ, it really wasn't often on our minds. We had our expectations. It was encouraging yesterday to be at the uh, funeral for Eric Blom. Many of you know who Eric is. And just hearing the testimonies of uh, these men, these men that were impacted by Eric. If you know Eric, he was rough around the edges. But if you've spent any time with Eric, you knew who Jesus was. He shared his faith boldly with everyone. And there were several testimonies there uh, of these men. And, uh, they, you know, in their lives, that was their struggle. Now, some of these guys were going through difficult times, and, and uh, they were walking low, and they had gone through alcoholism and drug abuse. And there was a lot of these guys that Eric could identify with. Because he himself had to walk through AA and all these things, and that was the path that God used for him to lead him to Christ. And as these guys would walk through, with it, you know, here's Eric telling them about Jesus all the time. They didn't want to hear it, but they kept coming back to him. And then at times when God was working in their life and they were at their lowest and at their bottom, they came looking to Eric for answers, and Eric shared Jesus. They weren't expecting that. They were looking for help, right? They were looking for help. Give me help from this bottle. Give me help from these drugs. Give me help from my family issues. I don't know what to do. I've reached the bottom. And when they came, expecting maybe something to help them physically or guide them through their life, they never expected that Jesus would transform their whole lives. It was a miracle in them. But that's the kind of expectation sometimes we have is those limited expectations. We have our expectations of what we want God to do in our lives, or even the lives of those that we love. But God's plan and God's purpose is bigger than anything we can imagine. And so I think we have to, again, raise our expectations. And I think we need to raise them. And here's a great example. Look with me back in uh, Genesis chapter 22. Again, another great familiar story here in the Word of God of Abraham. And we won't dig into the depths of all of it here, but just looking at Genesis 22 and verses 5 through 8. It says, And Abraham said to his, his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. 
and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. When we stop and think of this story, we see a great faith here in Abraham. Abraham didn't know where his help was going to come from. He didn't know how this was going to unfold. God did not send him the blueprints, right, that we all are expecting and wanting from God. Could you please spell all this out so that I can see every day and every hour how you're going to work all this out for me, God? I'd really appreciate that. No, we're not getting those. We're not learning faith if we're getting those. He's teaching us, and he's teaching Abraham, but what was Abraham's response? Abraham had great expectations of God. He knew God would provide a lamb. Why? Because he understood the past. He had a relationship with God that reminded him and helped him to understand, God made some pretty big promises to me. God's done some pretty amazing things. And he understood the truth that God had given him Isaac. That was a big moment. <laughs> and he understood that God said that he planned the future around him. And so he lived his life in such a way, say, well, I don't know what you're doing here, God, but you made this promise to me that you were going to build my future around Isaac. So he wasn't afraid walking up that hill. He wasn't afraid going up there. He wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. He knew what God had said. But he also understood and he trusted God. He trusted God. Where are we in that? When we are completely disoriented, when we don't get it, when we don't see what's happening in life and we're frustrated, are we responding in the way that Abraham would and say, boy, I don't get all this, God. I don't understand what's happening here. But I've got to go back to my instrument panel. I've got to look at the truth because that's the only thing that's going to guide me and tell me which way is up. And when I go back to that reality and back to that truth, I know who my God is. I know what he's capable of. I know what he's done and I know what he's promised. And I have to put my faith and trust in that. I don't know any better. I have to rely upon him. I don't understand it and I don't get it. But boy, we fight, don't we? We fight with our own minds. We fight and say, oh, I, I can figure this out. Or this doesn't make sense to me, so God must be wrong. Really? But we all do it, don't we? We have those times, we have those moments, maybe we have those years, right? Where we think we've got it figured out. Or we think, well, if that doesn't make sense and I don't get it, then therefore God must exist or God is no longer good or etc. You fill in the blank. And that just shows an, an immaturity in our faith. Sometimes we just get angry and frustrated at God and we just, you know, like a little child, we just kind of throw a fit and drop ourselves on the floor and flail our arms and legs and it's not fair. No, none of it's fair. Life's not fair, is it? But what our Savior had to endure for us, that wasn't fair either. And when we stop and think of that and we process those things in reality, that this world is not our home. It's not. You know, we're, we're trying to decorate a garbage heap and make it comfy. It's not our home. It was never meant to be. And God has a plan and he has a purpose. And so when we place our faith and trust in him and we go back to that reality, we recognize, okay, all right, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I believe. And, and that's where Abraham was. His faith was big. He knew God had a plan for him and his son, and so he wasn't worried. God, you got this figured out. And so what's your story today? What are your expectations of God where you're at in life? I think we all need to be reminded of another great verse, Hebrews eleven six, that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Those are huge words. 
if we're going to seek to live a life that pleases and honors God, and I hope that you're doing that, that's what God has called us to do. If we're going to please and honor Him, and the key really obviously here is living a life of faith. It's impossible to please Him if we're not. If we're not walking with Him, if we're not trusting who He is and what He's done and what He will continue to do. And so, if we're expecting great things from God, then that needs to lead us to the second point here this morning, is that we should then attempt great things for God. If we believe that God is who He says He is, and He is a great God, and we expect great things from Him, then we should be moving forth in faith, right? We should be attempting great things for God because we know what He's capable of. Certainly not what we can do, but what we know that our God can do and what He has done and what He wants to do if we understand His plan and His purpose, right? I heard again those testimonies yesterday of of people receiving Christ and lives being changed. God's still at work. He's still transforming lives. And he wants us to be a part of that. And we got a home waiting for us, and it'll be good someday. But for right now, this is our purpose, right? This is who we are, this is where he has us. So we have to fight through. We have to push through. We have to deal with the circumstances that were dealt. And seek to honor him through it and understand that we need to fulfill that purpose. And here's the big reason why, right? Because that's what we always ask the question, right? But why? But why? Right? We hear kids saying that, but we're just as guilty as adults. But why? Why do we have to do that? Why do we have to attempt great things for God? Well, we're going to look at some more stories here this morning. And the first one we're going to find in 1 Samuel chapter 17. We attempt great things for God so that we can show all the earth that there is a God. That is what God has designed for us to do. Look at 1 Samuel 17 with me. 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 37. Where it says, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. I love the faith of David. He was a young boy, kind of like all of us, right? Who hadn't experienced a lot of life yet. He hadn't allowed a lot of life's disappointments and discouragements and challenges to defeat him. He was young, he was ambitious, he was excited, but he was taking the truth that he knew. And he's looking around at him and saying, why is everyone so afraid? Um, Who is it that we serve? I'm not afraid of this guy. I don't care how big and ugly and hairy he is. I'm not afraid of him. Because I know who my God is. I know that God's going to deliver me. And what did David do? Well, he knew his past, right? He knew what God had done in the past. Let's jump down to verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. That's faith. That's faith. That wasn't him being cocky. That was David knowing. He's like, I was out there in the field when nobody was around. Nobody saw it. I was protecting the sheep. I took on bears and lions because that was my job. And it wasn't me. God gave me the ability to defeat them. And if God can do that for me, I'm not afraid of this guy. Because I know who my God is. I know what he's done in the past. And I know what he wants to do. I know who my God is. See, that's the difference. That's the walk of faith, is really knowing who our God is and what he is capable of doing. And when we grow in our faith to that point, it's amazing how problems can look smaller and God can look bigger. But it's a challenge for all of us, certainly for me, and we have to work through that. 
And again, for that purpose, right? Showing all the earth that there's a God. For David, by faith, he was willing to attempt great things for God. He wasn't afraid of, he wasn't backing down because he wanted to bring attention to his God. He wasn't doing it to promote himself or beat his chest and say, look how strong I am. No, his whole purpose and his whole mindset was, I'm going to defeat this guy because I want everybody else to see who our God is. That's my job <laughs> as a child of God, right? There's a song that I've come to really enjoy. I was just going to share a few of the lyrics with you because it ties right into this. The title of the song is called Sea of Victory. But just a few of the lyrics that go with it. It says, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls or fails, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant because I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory because the battle belongs to the Lord and not to me. And then the little last part of the song there goes on to say, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Folks, we have to have that kind of faith. We have to see that what's going on in our world, God is not unaware. He is not afraid of it. He knew it was going to happen. But in the midst of all that scary and all this stuff and all the things that may have destroyed our expectations, it's time for us to raise our expectations of who God really is and to be able to see how God is going to turn all that, all that evil, and he's going to turn it for good. That's the God who we serve. That's the God who we know. And that's the God that we need to be able to wrap our minds around and be able to study and get to know him so that we can build that faith that's so important. A couple more examples. Look at Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 16. It says, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Horsemen. And then we jump down to verse 31 of that same chapter. He says, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. These great things were done. Why do we do these great things? So everyone will know and everyone will fear and everyone will believe the Lord. It's why we move ahead in faith. That's why we do and attempt these great things for God. So others will know and hear. And then, of course, the great story we won't turn over there this morning, but in Judges chapter 7 and verse 2, we also do it to show others what God has done. We see where God defeated the Midianites with only 300 men. Why did God do that, right? It's a very unique story. It's interesting to read and study. Why did he keep whittling it all the way down? Well, because he wanted to make sure that no one could claim the credit but God. That it was obvious that day that the victory, the battle belonged to the Lord, and that was the God of Israel, because those 300 guys couldn't have done that. The battle was the Lord's. God did it. And that's that same mindset we have to have, right? Sometimes we kind of take it on our shoulders. Oh, I can't do that. I can't share my faith or I can't do that. I wouldn't have the words to say I couldn't do this. Well, that's good. No, you don't because God's the one who saves. God's the one that does the work. He's just looking for faithful volunteers to share, to just get out there and show other people that there is a God. 
doesn't always go well the first time, does it? Sometimes it doesn't always go well the 475th time. But when we're persistent, when we're sharing in love and faith and allowing people to know who our God is, eventually they'll come around. Again, one of those testimonies yesterday was somebody that knew Eric and would come into the shop all the time and eventually he stopped coming because he's like, I was tired of listening to him talk about Jesus all the time. He's like, I didn't want to hear it anymore. So he's like, I avoided him for weeks on end. And they finally came to agreement because Eric approached him and says, hey, you know, what's going on? He's like, well, you just won't shut up about Jesus. And Eric's like, okay, that's fair. He's like, tell you what, I'll back off. He's like, but when God convicts you and shows you that, that you know, you need to know your eternity and where you're going to go, I'll be here for you. You come and talk to me. And according to his testimony, it was within three to six months that some tragedy happened in his life, some difficult circumstances. And he turned right around and one day called up Eric and said, we need to talk. And he began to get discipled and came to knowledge of Christ. And that's, that's the story, right? That's the faith. We're not always going to get those great answers at first, but we're persistently sharing. We're sharing the truth. And maybe there's some of you that were that, uh, you know, bull-nosed and, and difficult, right, and stubborn. We all are, because we, we're all about self. And so we need to develop, develop that kind of faith and have those kind of expectations and, again, raise our expectations to match who God really is. Are we telling others about what God's done in our life? Are we, are we sharing that testimony? Are we allowing other people to hear about who he is. Sometimes they think, oh, I don't have this magnificent testimony. Yeah, you do. Because every testimony is magnificent. Every testimony is a testimony to the power of God and who he is and what he's done in your life. People need to hear that. I try to share that with people too, and of course they look at you kind of funny or whatever, but that's okay. Right? Because hopefully down the road, they're going to remember that. And it's going to be like these other testimonies that we're here that someday they're going to come and say, hey, can you tell me more about that? hey, can you explain that to me? And man, it's like, okay, here we go, right? We've got to plant those seeds. We've got to get that out there. We've got to let people know that there is a God and then be prepared when they come and ask us because that's exactly what God's doing. He's working in their lives and he wants to use us to be able to explain that, right? And, and take the word of God to them and encourage them and, and give them hope. How are we going to show others the power of God? Well, I believe it begins with our own faith. Our own expectations of who God is and the way that we live that out. And so again, let's expect great things from God so that we can attempt great things for God. Let me leave you with a quote from R.A. Torrey. He said this, Pray for great things. Expect great things. Work for great things. But above all, pray. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Let's be praying for those opportunities. Let's be praying for us in the desire to live for God and expect great things from God. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the word of God, the truth that we have, the instrument gauge, Lord, that guides us and helps us and keeps our focus where it needs to be. We're so thankful for you, God, and all that you've done for us, the ways that you've provided for us, the ways that you continue to guide us, and we just ask that you would help us to work through the challenges that we face, Lord, when we get lost, when we get discouraged. Help us to build our faith in you. Help us to go back to your word and find the faith that we need to walk in truth, expect great things from you, and then attempt great things for you, Lord, so that others may know the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim, for that message today. That's fantastic. For our closing hymn, let's please turn to page 200. When I have you sit and stand up, we're going to sing the first and the last.